Hi, everybody. <clears throat> um, so a couple of years ago, I was a product manager. Is there a clicker? Clicker's over here. Product manager at a medical device company uh, in the radiation oncology space. So for those of you unfamiliar with radiation oncology, if you get cancer, uh, one of the ways to treat it is with a therapeutic dose of radiation. You go under a big machine, it delivers this radiation. If you get a little bit too much radiation, it can be really bad for you. It's the short version of that story. Um, so I'm a product manager at this company. Uh, we're meeting with a very valuable uh, healthcare delivery organization for a four-hour st strategy meeting. And in the last five minutes of the meeting, they say, by the way, we're treating this foreign dignitary, I won't use their name because of HIPAA, uh, we're treating this foreign dignitary for prostate cancer, and we're concerned that the Chinese government is going to attempt to assassinate this individual by using a cybersecurity vulnerability in a medical device. So we penetration tested all of our devices, we found these 15 vulnerabilities, please fix them. And there was literal laughter in the room, like this is ridiculous, it would never happen, it couldn't happen. Uh, we started to dig into the specifics, and the device vendor said, listen, our device is on your hospital network, it's your responsibility to keep the Chinese government off of your, your hospital network. Um, so I started to think about this problem and dig into, is this really possible? And it turns out that yes, not only is it possible, it's, uh, it's shockingly easy for something like this to happen. Um, and try to figure out what the reasons were for the, the lack of cybersecurity features in, in, in some of these devices. So I, I figured what we would do today is go through sort of the wearable device example look at some of the possible cybersecurity vulnerabilities in these devices, talk about why they exist and, and what we can do to fix them. So a quick prediction, and this may not be uh, controversial in, in this particular room, uh, I feel that by 2030, about 50% or more of medical devices will be internet enabled. That's everything from uh, infusion, drug infusion pumps in a hospital will be connected to the general internet, surgical robots, which already happens, you can do surgery from across the world, not by an app yet, but by a, a surgeon. Um, I've even seen uh, Bluetooth connected scalpels. I'm not quite sure why you would need your scalpel to have a Bluetooth connection, but it exists, believe it or not. Um, some of the drivers for this, uh, healthcare is moving out of the hospital into the home. It's very expensive to treat a patient in the hospital, so let's treat them in their home if we can. Uh, in, in order to treat a patient at the home, we frequently need lots of data, and therefore we need devices to generate that data that are uh, going home with the patient. Um, I don't know if you guys saw this uh, press release or article that came out a couple months ago about Medtronic saying they want to shift their business model to better in line incentives with uh, the rest of the healthcare industry, where they only get paid if their devices are working. So this is a whole other conversation, like how you actually do that. But it's pretty clear to me that in order to figure out if your device is working or not, you need lots of data, and therefore you need connectivity. Um, so most of these wearable devices are too small to have their own dedicated internet connection. So a, a, a popular way to connect uh, these devices to the internet is via a Bluetooth connection to something like your phone or some small base station, and then that phone or base station sends data uh, over the, the general internet. And this can be everything from vital sign monitors to insulin pumps um, to other critical uh, uh, life supportive devices. So we wanted to figure out how secure is the average Bluetooth enabled device, um, so we, we hacked one. And to be clear, we, I, I at least think we're, we're the good guys here. We did not hack the device, partner with a hedge fund, and then short the stock of the vendor, which happened about 18 months ago to, to another company. We were working closely with a medical device vendor. We knew the executives at this company very well. We said, hey, would it be okay with you if we poked at this thing to see what we could find? And they said, yeah, sure, you, you won't find anything, but you can you poke at it. All right, so th this is the general architecture of the device that we were working with. So you've got a measurement device on the left. It sends data to, in this case, a base station over a protocol called Bluetooth Low Energy. So it's sort of a subset of Bluetooth, has some special properties that we'll talk about. And then that base station sends data over a Wi-Fi connection uh, to the, the internet, to a cloud server. Um, and then that cloud server sends data to a patient's phone so the patient can see uh, you know, the, whatever the relevant data is for this particular device. So there are lots of vulnerabilities in various aspects of this chain, but the one we're gonna focus on is the left, the, the connection between the measurement device and the base station itself. Um, so what we wanted to do uh, is, instead of actually showing people that, like you this specific device, we wanted to make a mock-up of the device so we wouldn't have to divulge the brand name of the, of the device or what the device actually did. And we did that with some very inexpensive hardware, these little computers called Raspberry Pis. They cost about 30 bucks. They run Linux, they're really cool. Uh, my five-year-old and I like to make them do things around our house. Um, so we, we used a Raspberry Pi on the left to emulate the measurement device. 
We had a Raspberry Pi on the right that emulated the base station. We had the two communicating data via, uh, via Bluetooth. Um, and then we had a third Raspberry Pi, which would act, uh, act as the hacker, uh, sitting between these two devices trying to do some bad things. So uh, let's take a look at what that looks like. So you're going to see two windows here. Uh, the window on the left is the measurement device itself that in this case is showing a heart rate. So you'll see the patient's heart rate varying. The window on the right is the patient's iPhone showing the heart rate value. What you would expect is if the heart rate monitor turned off a couple seconds later on the phone, the patient would get some sort of alert that, hey, something is bad here, right? It could be that the device lost connectivity. It could be that the heart rate value is actually zero. Um, but you want the patient to get some sort of alert. But what we found is we could have a, that window in the middle, a Raspberry Pi recording all of this Bluetooth data, um, not necessarily even knowing what it is. And as soon as the hacking device saw that the heart rate monitor stopped broadcasting data, it would start rebroadcasting old data. So in cybersecurity, this is called a replay attack. It's a relatively trivial, easy uh, attack. If you're trying to prevent your device from being hacked, this is one of the primary things you would look for. Uh, but instead, we found that we were able to convince that phone that the data it was seeing was from a valid measurement device. So this is bad for a bunch of reasons. So the, the first, first of all, rate, by raise of hands, how many people think that it is sort of an issue if a heart rate monitor is saying that your heart rate's 79, but it's actually zero? Great. So when we went to do the presentation to the medical device vendor, I was so excited going in. I thought, all right, we're going to do this presentation, and they're going to literally throw their wallets at us. It's gonna, no, no price will be too high to, to resolve the situation. So we go in and we do the vulnerability, and I'm like, all right, see, I we hacked your device. Uh, and the, and the, the guy sitting across me from the table is like, yeah, we, we thought you could probably do that. That's interesting. And then that was it, and then we didn't hear from them for weeks and weeks afterwards. Just no concern that this was actually an issue. Um, I was sort of shocked at the degree to which they, they did not think this was a problem. And we'll, we'll talk about why it's not a problem, or why they feel it's not a problem. Um, but the, there's sort of an immediate reason that this should be concerning to a device vendor and to a patient, and a, a secondary reason that it should be concerning. So here's the immediate reason. Obviously, if you're using this heart rate monitor to see if your patient is healthy and you're getting invalid data, you are no longer able to conclusively determine if your patient is healthy. That's the immediate reason this is a problem. But the secondary reason this is a problem was even more interesting to me. Um, the company that makes this device has really two value propositions. The first value proposition is they can tell you, is this patient's heart beating in the right rate or not? And yes or no, and that's important. They feel that they can diagnose a very difficult to diagnose, may, maybe otherwise impossible to diagnose, medical issue uh, hours or days or weeks in advance by using machine learning and uh, artificial intelligence to look at the big data that is generated here and, and spot patterns. And in fact, they have some very compelling data to show that by using machine learning, they can spot uh, fingerprints of a particular ailment months before the patient would become symptomatic. That's a really big deal. But if your big data model is using data that isn't valid, what happens to those algorithms? So the person across the table was telling me, oh, this isn't a big deal because you'd need to be in the room physically to do this, and you, know, you couldn't kill a patient with it. And I said, yeah, but you're, you're a venture-backed company that is hoping for a billion-dollar exit because of the value of your data. And by the way, when we did this hack, they gave us a production device to use. So at least 10 minutes of heart rate data in their production servers is from the data that we manipulated. So I said, okay, you're, you just told me you have a billion rows of data. Well, it sounds like you now have 999,960,000 or something, because a bunch of ours are in there and they're invalid. Um, so real quick, I'll gloss over sort of the technical reasons for this vulnerability in case any of you uh, encounter a, a Bluetooth-enabled medical device. You'll be a little uh, better, well, more well-versed to assess the technology being used, but then talk a bit about the organizational reasons for this. So the technical reasons, they use something called Bluetooth advertising instead of Bluetooth pairing. So Bluetooth advertising was developed, I believe, by Apple, so that when you walk into the Apple Store, your, your iPhone vibrates and it says, hey, welcome to the Apple Store. We've got new iMacs over here. Walk this way. You didn't need to pair with something in the Apple Store. They just knew that you were in there. It's technically very easy to have a medical device use Bluetooth advertising, but it's very insecure. Uh, the data they were sending, the heart rate data, was in plain text. So uh, my background is, is not in computer science. Uh, it, uh, it's in another technical field. But I was able to look at the data that they were sending in the Bluetooth logs, put it into Excel, do a very simple calculation, and say, oh, that's 79. That's 80. That's 78. That's probably the heart rate. They're just sending this data in plain text over Bluetooth. Uh, in addition to implementing Bluetooth insecurely, they were using a five to eight-year-old version of Bluetooth, Bluetooth version 4.0, 
that even if you were to use the most secure implementation of Bluetooth 4.0, there are still known vulnerabilities which allow somebody to hack this device. So I said, hey, why did you use Bluetooth 4.0 instead of 4.2? And they said, well, Bluetooth 4.2 is only on the newest Android handsets, so if we used that uh, protocol, a bunch of our patients couldn't use the device, so we had to use 4.0. So that's, that's a, a big issue. Um, they weren't using what's called cryptographic signing of the data, which is relatively simple to set up. So technical fixes, we suggested that they use Bluetooth version 4.2 bonding, we signed private keys, we had a bunch of encryption, whatever. Um, so I, I think the more important thing to think about are the organizational reasons for this vulnerability. So inside a medical device vendor, if you're on an engineering team or a product management team, usually what happens with these devices is some researcher somewhere is doing some you know, uh, primary research or they're hacking on something, they've got a, a, a research project they're doing, and they show it to their boss and they say, hey, I, I made this new class of device or I improved our device by using this new fundamental technology. And the boss will say, oh, that's really cool. You should take that prototype and add these couple of features, and then we'll show it to the president. And you add a couple of features, and the president says, oh, this is really great. Let's add these other couple of features and send it to this one hospital for initial trials. So your prototype becomes your minimum viable product. Next thing you know, that's a version one of the device. And at no point did somebody stop and say, hey, let's make sure that we're doing all of this securely. Um, that's not always the way that product development goes, but it happens a lot. On the engineering side, even if you were to plan to implement security features into these devices, the engineers essentially have an infinite number of feature requests, right? We would like this device to measure patient heart rate and uh, O2 saturation. We'd also like to have anti-gravitational properties and facilitate time travel if possible. Well, you've got these, this infinite number of feature requests and a finite number of engineers, and it's funny how the cybersecurity features usually get dropped below the line of what gets released in version one. Um, timelines to launch by a certain time, right? This one hospital needs this, this first device by whenever. We are, you know, our FDA submittal has to go into this date, or we've got this conference we need to present by. Another reason cybersecurity doesn't get, doesn't get prioritized. But this is the one that most troubles me. But when, we, when we hacked this one measurement device and we, we were sitting across the, the table from the executives, they said, okay, you can hack this thing, but why would anybody want to hack this device, right? There's no, there's no patient data in this thing, or there's patient data, there's no social security number. You couldn't kill a patient by hacking this thing. Um, so I've been searching for months for the best metaphor or analogy for how hackers think and why this is a priority. So does anybody know what this is a picture of? It's even more special than a torque screw. If you look closely, there's a little cylinder in the middle of the torque screw. This is a security screw in a bathroom stall divider in McCarran Airport. So you go in the bathroom, and you're using the bathroom. If you look at the way that the divider is attached to the wall, there's a screw, but it's this special screw called a security screw. They used to use Phillips screw screws or flathead screws, but apparently there was an issue, right? Apparently people were taking the bathroom stall dividers apart because they had a screwdriver in their pocket and it was making trouble for the, the maintenance staff of the airport. So they used special screws that people don't have, and it's actually pretty expensive to buy a bit for one of these things, so that people don't take apart the bathroom uh, airport stall. Why would somebody take apart a, an airport bathroom stall? I have no idea, right? The, what, what, there's, there's no social security number in an airport bathroom stall, but apparently people are just destructive, right? They wanna, they wanna poke at things. Uh, maybe it's humans have an innate curiosity as to how things work, they wanna break into things. Hackers don't always need a financial motive in order to do something. Usually it's some base level of intellectual curiosity and uh, you know, engin engineering types like myself like to think that you're smarter than everybody else and they say, oh, I see that the engineer who built this did this thing. I'm gonna show them that I can poke in here and do this bad thing. There doesn't need to be an obvious financial or safety implication for a hacker to want to hack something. That's not a reason to not have cybersecurity in your devices. Uh, another concern or ob objection that we got is, well, with Bluetooth vulnerabilities specifically, Bluetooth, which is used in most connected medical devices, has a range of about 70 to maybe 100 feet. So you would need to be within 100 feet of the patient. So this would really be a targeted attack, somebody being you know, in the next room of a hotel to do something bad to a specific patient. So uh, the, the chances of that, ha like who's ever gonna wanna hack my grandmother, right? My grandmother's not on anybody's hit list, I don't think. Um, she does love Fox News, only watches Fox News. So there may be some sort of political organization out there that would like to off my grandmother, probably not. Um, but, but this idea that you need, that the, the need for physical proximity means it's a low likelihood event apparently didn't sit well with the FDA. So 18 months ago, late 2016, 18 months ago, um, a group of hackers found vulnerabilities in a St. Jude pacemaker. Now normally what, uh, what we call white hat hackers, the, the good guys would do, 
is they would notify the vendor and they would notify the FDA and say, hey, I found this problem, you guys should fix this. And then ideally, the device vendor and the FDA work together quickly to release a software update in you know, a couple of weeks or months. But in this case, what the hackers did is they partnered with a hedge fund, they went on Bloomberg, they shorted the stock, they went on Bloomberg and they said, this vulnerability is so bad, this company's gonna go out of business, the stock price is gonna go to zero, we're shorting the stock. So this, the, St. Jude and the company Abbott that were trying to buy them, each of their, their market capitalizations, the value of their companies dropped by a billion dollars each overnight because of the uncertainty of the future merger and what would happen with all this revenue, had huge financial implications. So St. Jude came back and said, no, this isn't really a problem. The vulnerability doesn't really exist. Merger went through. Six months later, they said, oh, some of those vulnerabilities did exist. Here's a software update. Six months after that, a year after the initial disclosure, they came out with the FDA and said, actually, the other half of those vulnerabilities did exist, and they're a pretty big deal, so we need to recall 500,000 implanted pacemakers due to a cybersecurity vulnerability. This was the first time in history that the FDA um, mandated a recall of an implantable device due to cybersecurity issues. Um, and this is also, I could talk for hours about that, that particular issue. But my point here is that the vulnerability that forced this recall required the attacker to be in the same proximity as the patient. And a lot of physicians, cardiologists said, I'm not gonna update the software on this pacemaker and risk the patient dying because of this vulnerability. Who's ever gonna be in the next room of this, of Mike's grandma, right? But the FDA came out with this coded language. It was very, very odd the way that they, they worded it. They said, you know, message to the clinical community, please do not underestimate the probability or desire of somebody to actually exploit this cybersecurity vulnerability. Um, and they actually worded it a little better than I did. But they, they were saying something in there, I believe, like, hey, th this is a real issue. Even though pro physical proximity is required, don't underestimate the probability of somebody being harmed here. So a couple of takeaways for, for those of you who either are thinking of developing medical devices or are uh, uh, consumers of medical devices, either on the healthcare delivery side or as a patient. So number one, security is not a distraction from a medical device vendor's business. It, it is critical to the success of the business. If your device connects to the internet, you need to be thinking about these things. Number two, if your device connects to a network, congratulations, you're an internet company. When I worked at a medical device vendor, I would propose certain technological things and they would say, no, no, we can't do that, we're not Instagram. Well, if your medical device is connecting to the internet, you better start thinking about Instagram. Do you know how many times Instagram updates their software per day? Does any, anybody have an idea? Instagram, very popular iPhone app. They update their code 50 times per day. Their, their Instagram app, is the, the, the back end, the, the API that your app is talking to is being updated 50 times per day. How many Epic software updates are there per day? I'll leave that as a rhetorical question. Um, so internet companies, they deliver products continuously. They only build the software that isn't available as open source. So 15 years ago, uh, healthcare technology companies wouldn't touch open source software with a 100 foot pole. So there's too many licensing issues. Who knows if this has been validated? But it has been proven over and over again that open source software is more secure and reliable than software built by proprietary, proprietary teams because there are lots of people testing this. So just one point of, of uh, information there, Windows is not based on an open source technology and Mac OS is based on an open source Linux kernel. So that just gives you some idea of the, the reliability of those two uh, software development methodologies. Internet companies scour the internet for vulnerabilities in their software. If there's a vulnerability, they want to know about it. I have literally had medical device vendors tell me we do not want to do this because if there's a vulnerability, we don't want to know about it. We, you know, we would prefer not to know that there's a vulnerability. You can't think like that as an internet company. Um, internet companies pay hackers via a bug bounty. If you're a 17 year old kid and you contact Facebook and say, hey, I found a vulnerability where I can get uh, you know, the political affiliations of 83 million users, Facebook comes back and says, that's great, thank you for pointing that out, we'll pay you, you know, some amount of money. They have a calculation that they do to figure out how much they pay. They, they've paid 17 year old kids $100,000 for, for cybersecurity vulnerabilities. If you're a hacker and you contact St. Jude to say you found a vulnerability, you probably get sued. So it's, it's, a, it's a very different mindset inside the healthcare community, and I think we need to think more like internet companies in that regard. Takeaway number three, this guy does not care about certifications. So this is Hacker Man, great 80s uh, character from an 80s movie. Uh, when I go to these conferences talking about <clears throat> cybersecurity, I hear about ISO requirements and this certification, and we use this agile scrum technology, all this. All of that is great, but if your product doesn't have cybersecurity features, this guy doesn't care about how it was made. Right? If, you're, if your security process doesn't result in features being implemented into these products, they're not any more secure. So quick plug for us, so how we're addressing this. 
We have security software that gets baked into a medical device, so we're not a consulting organization, and we don't retrofit a product onto an existing device. Our code gets baked into the firmware of a medical device. We secure the data and instructions that these devices rely upon. We monitor what the devices are doing, looking for suspicious behavior, so that if some hedge fund starts trying to hack your device, ideally we get an alert and we call the vendor. Um, and the features that we have implemented are designed specifically to meet the new FDA guidelines that have come out in the last uh, year or two. So final thought, um, I get this question a lot, has this ever happened? Has anybody ever really ever hacked a medical device? And my answer to this more than a month ago used to be, well, right now we think it's just researchers that have been hacking these devices. We don't know of a case where a patient was actually impacted. So this study came out about three weeks ago, maybe four weeks ago. Um, Vanderbilt University did a study they looked for two years at mortality rates for patients that presented at a hospital with uh, having a heart attack of uh, MIA or whatever, uh, not a clinician, uh, and they looked at the mortality rates. How likely are you to die from a heart attack after presenting to the hospital um, if your hospital had been impacted by a cybersecurity breach in the last year or two years? And what they found is you had about a 1% more likely, you were 1% more likely to die of a heart attack if the hospital you were visiting had been hit by a cybersecurity breach in the last year or two. And in this article, it says that that translates to 2,160 additional patient deaths per year as a result of the cybersecurity vulnerabilities. So what we think will happen is in the next year or two, we will start to see quantitative analyses, data showing that patients have in fact been impacted by these sorts of cybersecurity vulnerabilities, potentially in a fatal way, even if it's not a targeted attack, if it's a secondary result of a cybersecurity breach that happened somewhere else in the value chain. Great, any questions? Thank you for that. <laughs> uh, you know, I, being a health scientist who's worked with big data since the 1990s, what's happening, especially and why we're having this conference is to talk seriously about some of the issues that are happening in technology in the healthcare space. Um, first, the previous presentation, we, there's no way that we can let HIPAA protected data be transmitted to, um, to devices, we just can't. So that's something, so I think your, your presentation is really important and that people should be listening to what he's saying because Deaths are related to these devices, all right? So if someone is getting wrong heart rate information and they're having a drop in blood pressure and it results in a fall, the person, that's, that's the issue. It's called you know, syncope. It's not a heart attack, but it's caused from a drop in blood pressure. Now, just a couple weeks ago, uh, uh, my, a family member of ours had a syncope attack in the middle of the night. And he fell, he's a tall guy, broke seven ribs and his clavicle and T4 vertebrae, okay? Now, I think I just cracked one rib because I happened to have a fall, and trust me, <laughs> that hurts. And it, I can't even imagine what seven would do. And then he got sent home early with a device without any care in the home and he got up in the middle of the night, he was confused because he just got out of the hospital and guess what, falls again. This time his head hits the, the um, edge of the tub and he cracked his skull open, okay? Now, if you think that these devices aren't important to the medical community, they are, it's not a game. So if you're monitoring heart rate and you say you're doing it reliably and in fact it's just repeated data this is a big problem, this is a big problem I have with AI. When you have non-reliable data, and, and believe me, the health professionals don't have reliable data. Because the EMRs, you're supposed, to be, you're supposed to be fixing the EMRs so we get the data so that we can help monitor health. We want you to help us fix those things. I know you can. But we hate Cerner, we hate Epic, and we hate the fact that it's not HIPAA protected, that it's not cyber secure, that we don't have interoperability, that we can't talk to each other. I mean, I've had patients who are the patient comes in and their father has a brain tumor. And I said, I don't have any medical records. And I have to say to the person, 
what kind of brain tumor? And they said, well, one in the brain. The, ba no, the bad one. One in the brain. Right. Okay, now I had to figure out, based on clinical exam, that it was in the cerebellum. But I have no idea if it's malignant. I don't know what kind of tumor it is. I don't know what treatment he's had. Yep. This is not a game, you guys. That's why I'm here, because this is not a game. You have the ability to do it. Yeah. Clearly, you do. Yeah. So I, I'd like to hear what all of you with your devices think you can do for us, because really, we have a problem. Yeah, so, so first, uh, my, uh, my uh, uh, apologies to hear about your, your, uh, your friend or family member's uh, health issues. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So uh, one, one asterisk on something you said there, which is you know, uh, to say that we can have interoperability between an app and an EMR, we, you know, we can't do it. I agree with you practically, it's, it's very difficult, right, because of the competing interests and the organizations that we're working with. Um, but from a technological perspective, there's really no reason that we can't, right? I mean, I can go on an app on my phone and uh, set up an account in Robinhood and put in my bank routing information and buy a share of stock and let it sit there for a while and then sell it and get the money. And like, that happens relatively securely. Th this has been done in other industries. Um, but we have not yet gotten to the point in healthcare where it's practically, uh, yeah. Yeah, the, the priority hasn't been placed there, yeah, great. Let's give a round of applause for Mike. Thank you so much.